Good morning and welcome. Yesterday we started the discussion of the two-dimensional convection diffusion equation. Before we continue on that, I would like to make a few corrections because in some points I was not precise enough, which I found out later. So the first point is the specification. of the example that we had for the convection fusion equation, which was the example C in the current chapter. That is the linearized two-dimensional Lavi-Stokes equation. I forgot to add, but I think you, you saw that yourself, that this was without pressure gradient and without source term. So that was the assumption, but I just want to add this. So we have considered a 2D linearized momentum equation. So that is usually then called the um, Navier Stokes equation, but in, in CFD, it's usually the momentum equation plus the continuity equation. But here, the point was not that, but it was uh, the following, it was for incompressible flow. And the thing that I asked you to add, that I forgot to really to point out, I thought I do now, that it was without pressure gradient. Because otherwise, the pressure gradient, if we would have a, a uniform flow, okay, the pressure would not have a pressure gradient, but we could imagine that we had one when we generalized things. And we did not include source terms. For example, gravity, or whatever you like. So this is just a um, specification. What we did there is actually useful for the stability analysis of the Navier-Stokes equations. When we do the linearization, we do that what we saw there locally. So the local velocity, and then we um, get this linear equation, and then we can do the stability on analysis on that with the phenomenon method, using our scheme that we want to analyze. That is something that we uh, are going to use today. So the, that was a specification. Now, regarding the stability condition, we found, or I gave the stability condition, I just um, told you about that, but telling that, that uh, deriving it is outside the scope of the course. But the stability condition that we derived for the uh, forward time-centered space, that was the equation 13, we had, uh, there we had um, two conditions. The first one, that was okay, that is the same condition as we would have for the 2D um, diffusion equation, but the second one was too restrictive. It's, it's okay, it works, it, is, it actually it's even better, but uh, we, have, um, we can include the stability in the following way. So there is a correction. And that is also in section, um, the same section there. No, it is, that is another one. It's the following. It is in 11.2. So I gave you the condition 13B. That is a sufficient condition, resulting in the condition on the set factor numbers. So this was the uh, velocity component in the x-direction, grid spacing, diffusion coefficient, that is the Peclet number in x-direction, plus the Peclet number in uh, the set Peclet number in y-direction, that small equal to. That is a sufficient condition, but to have it equivalent to the condition that we 
had uh, before, uh, it should read the following. That is B. That is the following. Actually, we can get we get a condition on the time step, which is the following. It is two alpha divided by the modulus of the velocity vector squared. So, and that is uh, less restricted than this. The interesting thing here is that this condition is <coughs> independent of delta x and delta y. So when we determine the time step, we take the condition 13a for the 2D diffusion equation and this equation, we take uh, this condition, we take the minimum. And then the other thing that was related to that um, when we express this as uh, the self Peclet number in x and y direction, the sum of that is more than equal to 2, that is corresponding to this. Uh, that should then read the following. It is the current number, C1 times the Peclet number, plus the current number in the y direction times the Peclet number, so Peclet number in y direction. So that is the, again it, it's okay, but it's, uh, this condition is uh, uh, more restrictive than this one. And uh, the so Peclet numbers are as we had defined yesterday. And another thing that was um, the a correction also in the same chapter, we had, um, that was I think number 15, it's, uh, this condition is necessary that I gave you, it was this one. I claim that to be equivalent, but uh, I uh, showed that this uh, showed how to derive it. But the equivalence actually is the following. It should be the following, and that is if we are really deriving it from the condition 12, then it is the R1 plus R2. The Neumann phenomenon numbers in x and y direction. So, and that is then the C1 squared uh, plus the uh, R1 plus R2 divided by R2 times the C2 squared. So, the, these factors to make it equivalent to, um, to the condition of, from which it is derived. So, uh, the, the rest was okay. R1 plus R2, so that equals as 1. So it is just this part here. So to be, to be have the full equivalence, it should be like that. So then, I hope uh, I correct it. Whatever, if you have any, please tell me. So this regards all what we have here to the forward time centered space. We have also seen the um, scheme where we have the advection upwind and the diffusion central. That was what we had uh, um, in the end, just to remind you. In one dimension, we have this example. <coughs> so then we saw that we can also uh, we get a similar. Okay, here. Now that is the problem now of the uh, the screen. It's uh, it, but it goes to 0 0.8. It's, let's see if we can fix that. So, and 
the comparison with the forward time-centered space, that is what, uh, what we had before, was that with this scheme, which has um, considerably more numerical viscosity, this uh, maximum here gets more damped than with the forward time-centered space. And by grid refinement, I found out that the exact solution lies uh, in between. So this gives a too low maximum, and the forward time-centered space gives a too high maximum. But when the grid refinement is done, then they converge to some uh, to the correct value. But again, this was the example then showing the effect of convection and diffusion. So in convection, we would have this uh, profile that originally was here from 0.2 to 0.4, just transported without change. But with the convection diffusion, we have both the transport, but at the same time we have diffusion. So the discontinuity gets smoothed. And then it depends on the quality of our scheme, how well we can resolve that. There are other schemes, uh, many other schemes around. I just want to mention, um, um, say one at least. This was in the upwind uh, for the advection, the center for the diffusion. And if we go back to the forward time-centered space, then we can do, instead of doing it explicitly, we can do it implicitly. And by that, we will remove the stability condition. So we'll have an um, unconditionally stable scheme. And that is, that is an option. It does not, however, give us high accuracy. For that, we still have to use uh, small grid spacings to get that. But regarding stability, we can then get rid of the stability condition. In the SOLAR algorithm, we have an explicit scheme. And there, we actually use the stability condition, the one that we have for the diffusion equation, and here is the, the correct one, and the one, and this one. We'll come back to that when we discuss the Navier-Stokes equation. Okay, but let me just finish up with the two-dimensional convection diffusion equation by uh, giving you the alternative to the forward time, the centered space, the backward time centered space. Instead of using the explicit Euler method in time, we use the implicit Euler method. That is all. And the scheme then, let's see which number do we have here. Let's see, I've used a different numbering. 17, 18, is this 19? Is it right? discretization as usual u i j n plus one minus u i j n divided by delta t and now we have the discretization of the um, convective terms first in x direction and then we do the same thing as we did before we have u i plus one j minus u i minus one j divided by two delta x but instead of taking that at the old time level, we take it now at the new time level. So that's, that's all. And the same for the y direction. We have the u i j plus 1 minus the u i j minus 1 divided by 2 delta y. And again, we take here n plus 1. And that is then equal to the diffusion terms 
that could also be taken at the new time level. second derivative in x direction, and then is at the new time level, minus 1j at the new time level, divided by delta x squared. Again, the same as for, as for the time-centered space, except for the time level, all at the new time level. Likewise, in the y direction, u i j plus 1 minus 2 u i j plus u i j minus 1 divided by delta y squared, and all at the new time level. So that is the, the scheme. Regarding the accuracy, it is similar to the <coughs> time-centered space. We have the time accuracy both for explicit and implicit Euler method is first order. which is centered for the advection and centered for the diffusion. So it is of second order in x and y direction. So it's a second order scheme in the space. But what is uh, the nice feature of this method is, as I mentioned just before, that this scheme is unconditionally stable. However, we have to pay a price for that. And the price is this um, scheme leads to a linear system that we have to solve in each time step. And uh, the type of matrix that we get, you can imagine that what we discussed for the Poisson equation, then we look essentially at this. And you see what is involved here is center point, the right neighbor, left neighbor of the east and west, the north and south neighbors, and that is the same here. Also regarding the, the convection or advection, also the i and i minus 1 and j plus 1, j minus 1, they are involved. So the structure will be similar as we discussed for the Poisson equation regarding the structure. So it's a block block tridiagonal matrix. If you look at the, at the as it looks like, it is a pentadiagonal matrix. So it has five diagonals. The center diagonal is too close to the diagonal and too further, further away. And that has to be solved in each time step. And that is much more costly, of course, than using um, an explicit scheme as the former time-centered space. But we have no stability restriction. The matrix has, however, a different structure than we have discussed for the Poisson equation. For the Poisson equation, the matrix was symmetric and positive definite. Here, it is neither uh, symmetric, and the, sy the symmetry, asymmetry comes from here. Because here we have a plus and here we have a minus. So, it is uh, actually that part is anti symmetric, this part is symmetric. And the diagonal dominance is only guaranteed for self Peckley numbers smaller than equal to. So if it's larger, then diagonal dominance is not guaranteed. <coughs> and what we have done here, we can also do for the other scheme that we discussed, the direction uh, upwind and diffusion centered. We can also do that implicitly. We will have the same result 
as we had for the, sent for the explicit scheme, it is on the first order in time and space. It is also unconditionally stable, but it is guaranteed diagonally dominant. It is not symmetric, the matrix, but we have also to solve this system, of, uh, this linear system in each time step. So that is another example. And then there are many, many others. You can take essentially all the schemes that we discussed for the uh, linear advection equation and apply that to the discretization of the advection part. The diffusion part is usually well taken care of by the standard centered discretization. So that is usually not a problem. That is a, a, usually works well. If you want higher accuracy, you can do that also. But for second order, this is fine. But this part, we can choose different options. One option would be to use um, muscle for the upwind scheme to get higher order with a limiter and then use a cutter scheme. That is also possible. So there are many options which are actually used. Other things that we did not discuss here, instead of muscle, ENO, essentially non-oscillatory, or weighted ENO schemes. <clears throat> Those schemes have been used by my PhD students for the Navier-Stokes equations because they are of high order accuracy. But we don't go into detail on that. That should be enough for, give, for giving you an idea of the discretization of the two-dimensional convection diffusion equation. Instead, we want uh, to have a, um, a, a look, a short look, an introduction to the discretization of the Navier-Stokes equations for incompressible flow. And that is then related to exercise 12, where Rayner supplied you with a solar algorithm, and I want to give you the the theory behind that. So that is essentially this part of the uh, course pointing uh, to the follow-up course, TP4165, Computational Heat and Fluid Flow, where we go into much more detail in, in that. And also regarding uh, compressible flow. But here we then just give, want to give you an introduction to the discretization of 2D incompressible Navier-Stokes equations. start as usual with a physical and mathematical classification. And here I can refer to the course on fluid mechanics that you all had, TP4100 or 4110 or 4105, there are different ones, but they are essentially very similar. What we describe here is two-dimensional flow of an incompressible fluid, and that is governed by the 2D incompressible Navier-Stokes equations, and we consider constant viscosity, so that is uh, what is quite common. So that is 2D flow of an incompressible fluid. And in our case, we simply assume that the density is constant. Governed by Here we assume that is the restriction 
constant viscosity. We can also have that more general, but here we do this restriction that simplifies the viscous term. And we had already discussed it in section 2, actually, but we repeat it here because it is really essential. times the second space derivative, some second space derivatives of u. Again, we assume that we have no uh, we have no soft term here. We don't consider gravity. We could do that, but in the Sula algorithm, we don't do it. And in aerodynamics, usually it is not necessary because that uh, term is usually negligible in aerodynamics. So that's the x momentum equation that we have here. And likewise, the y momentum equation. Then we have a similar expression for the velocity component v in the y direction. We have again the convective term which is u dv dx plus v dv dy is equal to, and now we have the dp dy. And we have then again the Laplacian of v now, which is the second derivative of v with respect to x plus the second derivative of v with respect to y. So that is the y equation. And usually, this would be called in fluid mechanics the Navier-Stokes equations. But in CFD, it has become common to include also the continuity equation under this heading. And the continuity equation for two-dimensional incompressible flow is simply v dx plus v dy is equal to zero. So that is the continuity. So then we have this set of equations. And in here, as I already mentioned, we have u, the velocity components, p, the pressure, rho, that is really interesting that we assume that the density is constant. Um, rho constant density is the assumption that we do. And the new, as usual, the kinematic viscosity, which is also assumed to be constant. to understand the mathematical character. If we consider the 
the, say the pressure gradient here as a, a source term. <coughs> we are interested here, you have here uh, first for the exponential equation, we have a time derivative. And then we said decisive or for the type is then the highest spatial derivative. And that is second derivatives. So that means we have the same type as the diffusion equation. That means the type of the momentum equation in X is parabolic. The same is true for the Y direction. So both the X and Y momentum equations have parabolic character. So we can note that. So the momentum equations, <coughs> that is one A and B, they are parabolic PDs. So that means that we have to give boundary conditions everywhere, all boundaries. And the common boundary conditions are at inflow we prescribe U and V, and at outflow we have to uh, usually we have to extrapolate them, that is quite common. If we have a solid wall, then we have no slip condition where u and v are zero. Or if we have a, a non-stationary body, then the velocity would be the velocity of the moving body. If the body is in stationary, then the velocity is zero. So no slip means that the velocity at the body is equal to the velocity that the body has. Okay, so that is then the regarding the momentum equations. Then you see also now what we uh, discussed just before, the convection diffusion equation. They are of this type, you see, because we have here, we have the convection. It's not constant. You and V are not constant, but still. It's, uh, and here we have the diffusion. And this part here, the pressure uh, gradient, look at the whole um, vector equation, that would be then a source term. And that's the reason why it is so important to discuss the convection diffusion equation, because we can apply that directly for the solution of these momentum equations. The other equation and uh, what, what the pressure and how to get the pressure, that is not so clear. But we discussed already in chapter 9, as an example for the Poisson equation, how we get, can get a Poisson equation for the pressure, in fact. And that is the following. the divergence of the momentum equation, that is we can take the dx of the x momentum equation plus the d dy of the y momentum equation yields and uh, I'm not derived all the details in that but you can also look it up in in chapter 9 1 and equation 7, and you can do it if you like also as a simple exercise, you will find that we get the following, um, that the Laplacian of the pressure, so that is the Nabla squared, that is actually the same operator that we had here, that is the Nabla squared u, Nabla squared b, we get here the Nabla squared p. Laplacian of the pressure is equal to minus density times, now I write it in the, in the form that this denotes a derivative, du dx squared plus 2 du dy times dv dx plus dv dy squared. And that indicates that the pressure is governed by an elliptic PDE. So this equation that we have here is an elliptic PDE. 
you for the pressure. And that means if we summarize this for the U and V, the velocity components, we have parabolic PDEs, and for the pressure we have an elliptic PDE. Elliptic means, again, we have to give boundary conditions at all boundaries. That is uh, this uh, jury problem which is decided by the boundary conditions. And from that we can conclude that the Navier-Stokes equations, so first the incompressible Navier-Stokes equations, here we looked at it in one, in 2D, but could be even similar in 3D or in 1D. Incompressible Navier-Stokes equations are of elliptic parabolic type. So that is the conclusion. And again, as we discussed already, we have to give boundary conditions at all boundaries. For the velocity components and also for the pressure. And this, by the way, the pressure, the elliptic equation for the pressure, that means when we change anything, for example, at the boundary, it will be immediately felt everywhere. That is the character of an elliptic problem. We change something, for example, at the boundary, that is what, where we have control, then it will be immediately felt everywhere. And that is contradicting compressible flow. The compressible flow will take some time until, say, the speed of sound has traveled to the, to the point where we are, for example. So then the pressure change is not immediately felt. But it takes some time. That, that problem is different. So for the compressible Navier-Stokes equations, they are of hyperbolic parabolic type. The parabolic type is the same for the momentum equations. But we have a moment, the continuity equation with a time derivative, and that has a hyperbolic character. Okay, so we have then this mathematical classification, and now we want to do the discretization. There are many schemes around, but one of the first ones, ones that has been very successful is the one that is used in the solar algorithm, in the solar the code, and that is the marker itself method. It was developed in 1965 Salamus, in the United States, by Harlow and Welch. So, for free surface problems and um, that is by Arlo and Welch in 1965. The idea is the following. First, an intermediate velocity components are computed. In originally, it was com they were computed without the pressure gradient, but it is actually advantageous to use the pressure gradient already, but fully explicitly. And then, an equation is derived for the pressure or the pressure correction such that the uh, continuity equation is fulfilled. So it is a, a method that uh, you can also consider as a fractional step method. So it's doing certain, uh, essentially 
it is so the problem is solved stepwise. Do that. So the first step is compute intermediate velocity components. So provisional velocity components. They are often numbered by u star and p star from the momentum equations. So that is the first step. We, we do the, the details later. And the second step is then determine the velocity components at the new time level, that is u n plus 1 and v n plus 1 with the new pressure that Pn is the old time level that we know, such that the new velocity has zero divergence. And that is called that the, the, that the Vn, the velocity at the new time level, is then the u n plus 1, v n plus 1, that is the velocity vector at the new time level, is divergence free. That means it fulfills the continuity equation. Another name for divergence free is solenoidal. So that, is, that are the two steps. So first we start with getting a preliminary or intermediate velocity component, just solving the momentum equations with an explicit Euler method in time. And then we get some velocity components u star and v star that usually do not fulfill the continuity equation. But this condition then, that we say the new velocity um, must be the intermediate one plus some uh, correction. That should be then uh, the divergence of that should be zero. That gives us a condition for the pressure. So the pressure is the, our, our guy that, give, that makes the velocity divergence. So that is this condition on the divergence gives us then the condition on the pressure. That is in, in line with this, what we had discussed here. Because when we do this derivation, we assume that we have a divergence free velocity. But here we um, use this idea to get a condition on the pressure, such that the pressure makes the velocity at the new time level divergence free. So that is the outline of the method. We'll look into the technical details after the break.